Now it's time for our wrap up. Let's give it everything we've got. Ready? Begin. All right, y'all. Welcome back to class online. Uh, Friday, last day of this first week, this first go at it. Uh, we got unit 10.3 today. And this will be the last bit that we kind of do on Moses, at least the initial part of the Moses story, right? Um, so we're going to have a lot to do with Moses, the Israelites wandering in the desert. But this is going to kind of conclude that, that first moment here where the Israelites have transitioned now from Egypt uh, and slavery to the desert in freedom. And you're going to see pretty quickly, uh, probably not today, probably at the beginning of next week, but you're going to see pretty quickly that uh, the Israelites almost wish they were back in slavery in Egypt rather than wandering in the desert. And if you know anything about the story, you know that they wander in the desert for 40 years, right? And so again, that number 40 comes back into play where uh, you've got a period of trial, testing, uh, sacrifice, and waiting, right? Um, the thing we're going to look at today, though, is that initial reaction of the Israelites after they've been freed from Egypt, okay? Uh, so the first thing you'll notice is that what the Israelites do uh, after they have seen the Red Seas parted, a pillar of fire guide them out of, uh, of Egypt, that God has saved them from slavery, from Pharaoh, and the rule of the Egyptians. The very first thing they do, rather than thank God and give glory to God, the very first thing they do is they complain. They realize after all the, uh, the excitement is over that they're hungry, right? And so they, they turn to God here, and you can see it right here. Um, they turn to God and they say, we're hungry, we're thirsty, like, what gives? Like, I thought we'd be free and happy in this, this new land. And so they go to Moses and it's like, look, you know, what's up with God? You know, he freed us, but now he's not going to take care of us. It doesn't seem to make sense to them. And so what you've got right now is you, you've got this very natural human reaction uh, to complain when things don't go your way, right? Especially when you thought things were going to get better and now they almost seem seemingly worse. You know, at least in Egypt, you had food, you had a house. Uh, yes, you had to go work for the Egyptians. Yes, you were forced to do it. But at least you had some basic comforts. Now you're out in the desert with nothing, right? So where do the Egyptians, or sorry, where do the Israelites go from there? Well, they go to Moses. And so they say, Moses, you know God. You go talk to God. See if you can get us something, right? And so Moses goes and he talks to God and he prays to God. And he says, you know, look, God, uh, the people are hungry. They're thirsty. You know, I know that you will stay faithful to us. Um, please, you know, if it is you know, in your will, give us something to eat. Okay. Now, what you see in this episode is that Moses, once again, is that mediator between the people and God. So uh, I, I don't think I mentioned this in the last video, but Aaron, Moses' brother, is a Levite from the tribe of Levi. And that's where the priestly line of the Jewish people are going to come from, from the Levites, right? And so you see this priestly role coming about where there's this mediator between the people and God, right? And that's the same thing we talked about the other day, that that's what the priest does at Mass, is that he takes our prayers and he brings them to the Lord. So extending that connection, what does God do? Well, God sends the Israelites food from heaven, and this comes in the form of manna, right? At least that's the big one, is that the, it comes in the form of manna, which is this, you can see it here, it's this kind of, um, not frost-like, but kind of uh, dewy-like substance uh, that comes on the ground, and you kind of collect it and form it into food. And this manna appears, and it feeds the Israelites, and they, they realize that they are full, right? Um, there's also some, some quail that appears. And then with, for, the, uh, for the water, God instructs Moses to take his staff, strike it against a rock, and from the middle of that rock, water comes forth. On a side note, pretty cool thing is that you can actually see uh, a place in um, not too far outside of Egypt where we think this uh, rock exists, that there's water residue coming from this rock where there's no business that a stream should have come from this, this area, right? So we're definitely in the territory where these are real things at real locations. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to talk about Mount, Mount Sinai. We know where Mount Sinai is, right? Like we know where Moses received the Ten Commandments. These are real places. Uh, these are the things that really uh, did happen, right? Okay, so why do we look at this stuff? Why do we care about the manna from heaven? 
uh, okay, that's a great story, Mr. Flores, but you know, what's the important point here? Well, the important thing to note, and you can see it right here on the screen, is that the manna from heaven is a again one of these prefigurings of Christ, especially present in the Eucharist. Right? There's a distinct a material similarity between manna and the Eucharist. Right? It's not exactly one to one, but there's a distinct uh, similarity there. And the idea is that it's this food from heaven that will ultimately give you life. Now, for the Israelites, it gives them you know sort of that material physical life. Right? It's this primitive form. And then we know that Christ, when he comes, he talks about that, you know, he will give the water uh, that, of life that will never leave someone thirsty again, right? And this woman at the well, again, another uh, story of the well, Jesus approaches the Samaritan woman and says, you know, if you only knew who was speaking to you, you would want this water that will give you life everlasting. And she says, you know, Lord, please give me this water to drink. And the same thing's happening right in the Eucharist is that, yes, the manna from heaven fed the Israelites for, for a day, the next day, but the manna from heaven in the sense of the Eucharist, right, will give us life everlasting. And so you see this type uh, play out here in the Exodus story. The same thing is true with the water, right? That the water comes from the side of the rock in the same way that the water will flow from the side of Christ at the crucifixion, right? So the centurion pierces Christ on the side and blood and water spill out, right? And so the same thing is happening here in Exodus that prepares you to understand some of the symbolic language or, you know, the, the sacramental language that's going to happen in the New Testament. Okay, so that's the big takeaway right now is that, you know, first, Moses is a mediator between the Israelites and God in the same way that a priest is a mediator between us and God. And this is the same thing that's going to happen between us, Jesus, and his Father, right? And that's played out especially in the, the role of the Eucharist in our life. Okay. So today we're going to try to just do one video, keep it short. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide, and we'll go from there. Okay, same story happens again, though. Uh, the Israelites are pretty content for a little while there, and then they rebel. Uh, even though God is providing them with food, he's providing them with water, he's gotten them out of slavery, the Israelites quickly forget the good things God has done. And we talked about already that the Israelite story is going to be a microcosm of our own life, right? That the, or you could say the microcosm of the human experience of life, is that we very quickly forget all of the blessings and good things that God has for us. And the Israelites, again, are a perfect emblem of this, is that, again, God has given them this food, he's given them the water, and then all of a sudden, they go off and they worship the golden calf, right? They, they, uh, they get a little restless again and say, maybe God's not with us, maybe we should worship a new God. Right? And so they come up with this idea of worshiping the golden calf. And you, you've heard of this story, right? And they gather up a lot of their gold, they form it into um, this, this figure, and they pray to that instead of God. Now, it seems kind of crazy to, to our ears uh, to hear, why would they worship, you know, uh, why would they make a new image and then worship that? Well, you probably heard the analogy drawn before. We probably don't worship golden objects that look like calves. Uh, but we do worship golden objects in the sense of whether it's money, power, status, maybe material comfort, is that we often immediately forget the good things that God has given to us and we turn back to worshiping some material thing that's not God, right? And, you know, without getting too much into this, you know, you can think how quickly it, it, it is when things are going good to forget to pray, right? That when your life is going really well, maybe God's not so important. Now, right now, with the coronavirus thing, with the quarantines, there's a lot of people that are turning to God in prayer because they need help. And the Israelites are doing the same thing, right? When they need help, they turn to God. When things are going well, they forget him and they worship something else. And think about in your own life, and I know it's true in my life, right, that there's these moments when things are going so well that you forget to worship God. and Instead, you think maybe you're the reason that things are going well. So what does God do? His response is he summons Moses to the top of Mount Sinai. This is actually a picture of Mount Sinai in the background. Okay, so you can go to Mount Sinai. It's a real place. And you know what happens next, right? God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, you might think, why did the Israelites need these Ten Commandments to do what it seems pretty obvious, right? To, to you know, love your neighbor. Well, that's actually in the, the New Testament. But you know, to not kill, to not uh, steal from your neighbor, to not uh, covet your neighbor's possessions or their, their spouse, right? 
it seems like these are pretty normal things uh, that you would already know not to do. Well, again, think about how often you need to be reminded uh, to do the right thing. And so this, you think of this as this divine command, it makes a bigger difference, right? Like uh, if you've ever been in an argument maybe with your brother or sister and you're saying the exact right thing, right? You're trying to say, who's the greatest quarterback of all time? And you start listing out Drew Brees' stats and your, your brother's like, no, it's Tom Brady who now plays for the Buccaneers. And he starts listening about a bunch of stats. And then you turn to your dad, right? You say, dad, tell him Drew Brees is the best quarterback of all time. And your dad sits down your brother and says, son, Drew Brees is the best quarterback of all time, right? It's that authority that comes from that, that voice that, that kind of settles the matter. And again, that's kind of a matter of opinion between Tom Brady and uh, Drew Brees. But think about the moral life, right? You probably already know not to kill. You probably already know not to steal. You probably already know not to you know, harbor envy or lustful thoughts. You, you know those things, right? But when it's a command from God, right, the divine king, that carries a different weight than if it's just kind of floating around out there like, ah, I know I probably shouldn't do that. But when someone that you love, and hopefully you do love God, right? If someone that you love gives you this command, it, it shows something else about the relationship there, right? And so the same thing we said with the plagues, where the plagues kind of show us that it's God who is the creator of the universe. It's God's uh, role to be the, the ruler or he has the power over creation. You can kind of think of the same thing here with the Ten Commandments. Yes, it, it is true that by human nature, we know not to do these things because they're, they're wrong. But then it's also showing you the reason behind it is God. Because God wants you to become like him, a creature like himself. That you no longer have to think of the rules. You just exist in a way that says, I know this already. And so God's saying, I've got to remind you of this because I have set these rules so that you can become like me. Right? And that's the next point here is that Israel is meant to be a holy nation a nation set apart from other nations. So unlike the Egyptians, you're not going to practice these brutal things. Unlike the Babylonians, right? You're not going to have, um, or the Canaanites too, these uh, multiple wives and affairs and things like that, right? Unlike those people, you are going to be a people built like me in my image and likeness. And so he's reminding them of those things that the reason behind the rules are himself, right? The reason is himself and that you are called to be like God. Okay, so finally, uh, we got uh, the Ten Commandments uh, themselves, right? So Moses is given the Ten Commandments, and this is the really the big sealing of the covenant again with the Israelites, right? So we've already had the rainbow, we've already had circumcision, and now we get the Ten Commandments. God is continually renewing the covenant, not that he's broken it, but that we break it, right? And so this time he gives them the Ten Commandments and says, look, I'm going to keep my end of the deal but you've got to follow me, right? You've got to follow my rules because I want you to become like me, right? And we're going to get into that a little bit more, especially as we get closer to the New Testament, okay? Um, one last note on that then, yeah, the connecting to the New Testament is that this law, the Ten Commandments, and then a few other laws that are going to come with it uh, are known as the Mosaic Law, and that's the ones that the Jewish people practice pretty much all the way up until Jesus, and that's why Jesus is such a controversial figure in the New Testament, because some of the interpretations of the Mosaic Law, right, that the Jewish people have been practicing since the time of Moses, come into question when Jesus starts, again, doing miracles on the Sabbath, right, working on the Sabbath, right? And they say, well, you can't work on the Sabbath. Moses forbid it, right, in the, in the commandments. You, know, you should keep holy the Sabbath and rest on that day. And Jesus says, basically, like, look, I'm the reason for the Sabbath. Right? And that um, he's trying to show them that while there were these laws, you know, the basic laws, the primitive laws of the Ten Commandments, I'm going to give you this new law that's fulfilled in himself. And that's that same, um, that same motion, right? That we're trying to become like Christ, trying to become like God. And so God is preparing the people to become like him at first in small steps with the Ten Commandments, and then in bigger steps with the great commandment of love that we're going to see in the New Testament um, from Jesus. Okay, so last thing for today, and then uh, this will go into the weekend, is this, the Ten Commandments themselves. Uh, so you might want to pause the video if you want to write down all ten right now. Um, and so after you pause the video, write down the Ten Commandments, 
uh, come back and uh, I'll explain it right now. So the first three are all about God. The, and it's really easy to remember that because you can say God comes first. So the first three are all about God. Number one, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods besides me. It's a pretty easy one to understand. It's pretty difficult in practice, right? Think about how many times you have some other desire, some other thing that's more important than God. And then the rest of them are kind of connected to that, right? At least the next two, right? So you've got, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain, right? So if you, if you love God, if God is really your God, then you, don't, you would not uh, you know, swear by his name in this inappropriate way, right? Because you love God as your king and, again, your God. And then the same thing true with, uh, with, the, with the Sabbath, right? That if God really is the most important thing in your life, you're going to go to Mass on Sunday to try to, you know, show your love and thankfulness to God. If you have that feeling of, I don't know, I think I'd rather play video games on Sunday, or, you know, I've got uh, you know, some kind of sport or club that's, that's meeting on Sunday, and I don't know if I'll have time to do that and go to Mass. Well, there you go, right? Like, it's not just number three that, that is in trouble. It's number one, right? Because God is not uh, the king of your heart in that sense, right? So um, the first three talk about God and your relationship to God. The next ones, the next seven, are going to be about your relationship to other people, right? So the next one is the most important people outside of God, your mother and your father, right? So are you honoring your mother father? Are you being a good and loving son, right? That's a really big one. So you've got God, number one, family, number two. And then after that, it's about your relationship to the outside world, right? So God's one, family's two, and then, you know, outside world is uh, three, comes next. And we've been over this, right? It seems pretty easy that you should understand you shouldn't kill people. Uh, you shouldn't steal. You shouldn't lie. That's what bear false witness means. You shouldn't uh, commit adultery and lust after uh, your neighbor's wife. It just, just means lust in general, right? And then you shouldn't covet your neighbor's goods. Envy, greed, jealousy. Okay, so why do we think we need these rules? Last point for today. It's not that we couldn't do these things outside of the Ten Commandments. And you're going to hear that uh, from a lot of people, uh, you know, like, like the new atheists, that will say, you know, religion's done nothing good. We knew how to be good people without the Ten Commandments. Again, all of that may or may not be true in, the, in some sense. Or you could flip it around. That it's so natural to us already because we were made, we are made in the image and likeness of God that it's imprinted in our heart to follow the very same things of God. And the Ten Commandments you could think of as being a reminder that calls us out of our inward-looking self and back towards God, right? Looking at God. And you could, I, it's not like Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Where they go, it's more like guidelines anyway. Like, no, these are, these are hard and fast rules. You, you shouldn't do these things. But they're also the basic rules. And sometimes we can make the mistake of thinking these are the only rules. Like this is, this is a good start. And if you're following the Ten Commandments, great. But the story of the rich young man in the New Testament, right? Jesus says uh, to the guy, who's, the rich young man says, Lord, what can I do to get into heaven? And Jesus says, well, do you follow the Ten Commandments? And the rich young man says, yeah, I follow every single one. He goes, good. Now sell what you have and come follow me. And the rich young man goes away sad for he had many possessions, right? That's how the story goes. The idea is that if you get the Ten Commandments down, that's the starting point. And a lot of people think, especially, again, the new atheists, they think this is the ending point. But what you're not going to see on here, right, you see a lot of don'ts. A lot of don't do this. Outside of the first uh, four, it's a lot of don'ts. The Christian life is about a lot of doing. That's why this list is so small, because the list of what you can't do is actually pretty small. But the list of what you should do is quite large. And that's where the virtues come in, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And those are the ones that are really going to guide your actions out into the world to, to do the things of, of Christ, right? To become Christ to other people. And so I want you to think more of the Ten Commandments as, as the starting point. And then when we get to the New Testament, God's going to give us a new commandment uh, through the example of Jesus, right? Okay. So great first week. I know it was only three days. Uh, we're going to just have the same uh, process uh, end quiz for, for today. So make sure you do that quiz. And then next Thursday, okay, so a week from yesterday, 
we're going to have our first test. Okay, so we'll have a small quiz probably Tuesday just to make sure that we're up, up to speed on everything. And then our first test will be next Thursday. And you'll have 24 hours to finish that. So you'll have until you know, Friday or so to, to finish it. Okay. All right, guys, have a great weekend. And I will see you on Monday.